everybody. Very warm welcome to this online event on global carbon pricing. We are very happy to have you on board despite of the difficult circumstances that we all are currently in. My name is Dennis Schrei. I'm the director at the Multinational Development Policy Dialogue of Konrad Adenauer Foundation here in Brussels. At the foundation, we have a very clear philosophy. It's building bridges, especially between the European Union and the Global South. We are covering a very wide range of topics from security, foreign policy, democracy, over to sustainable development and climate change. In this regard, we are today launching a new series of events on the external dimension of the European Green Deal. And this could be a hardly better topic to start with, global carbon pricing. Indeed, global carbon pricing has become highly popular across the world. Recently, it has surged to the top of the EU green diplomacy. Just a few weeks ago, as you probably all have heard, the European Union Commission President Ursula von der Leyen has called at the World Economic Forum for a global leveling playing field in carbon pricing. However, how realistic is it to expect a global carbon price anytime soon? What are the Global South priorities and challenges in matters of carbon pricing? And how can the EU contribute to a global level playing field? These are some questions that we would like to address and discuss today with our panelists from around the world. Let me introduce to you our panelists. We have from the European Commission, DG Climate, Ms. Beatrice Jordi. She is the Director for International Carbon Markets at DG Climate. Then we have from Indonesia, Mr. Dida Gardera. He is an Assistant Deputy Minister for Environment Conservation at the Indonesian Coordinating Ministry for Economic Affairs. Then we have with us Mr. Andrew Gilder, the Director of Climate Legal, which is a climate consultancy in South Africa. Very warm welcome, Andrew. We have with us also Dr. Luta Taschini from the London School of Economics Grantham Research Institute and the University of Edinburgh Business School. Welcome to you, Luca. And finally, our moderator today is William Eckworth, the Deputy Head of the International Carbon Action Partnership, who will moderate this event. Okay, Dennis, many, many thanks. Um, so first of all, thank you to the, to the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung for, for convening this event. I think it's, um, it's, it's fantastic that we can come together as a global community during these times and discuss the increasingly important issues of climate change and, and carbon pricing. So this is a, this is a really great event um, with a fantastic panel and many thanks to, to your organization for, for organizing this. I would also just like to say welcome and thanks to all of our listeners at home. Um, I hope you're all safe. And um, it's, it's also great to see participation really from all around the globe. So we're very much looking forward to an active discussion. Um, there's different ways in which you can get involved as Dennis has just said. So we will have polls, which I'll really encourage you to participate in so you can engage with our panel. You can ask questions through the Q&A box and we will have a, Q, uh, a moderated discussion with you all um, starting at 4 p.m. Uh, but now, not to take any more time away from, from the panelists, I would like to get straight into the discussions. And so, Andrew, I would like to, to start off with you. Um, South Africa saw the implementation of a carbon tax um, on the 1st of June last year. I was wondering if you could just um, explain a little bit more to our audience how this tax functions and what role it plays for South Africa in terms of the environmental, social, and economic development. Um, thank you very much for that, William, and um, thanks to, to Cass for the opportunity. Um, the, the, the focus of the event um, I find very interesting because um, the look towards um, European policy vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world I think is really important. So um, South Africa um, has taken very seriously for um, more than a decade uh, the notion that it is um, a substantial source of industrial greenhouse gas emissions and needs to um, implement interventions to deal with that. Um, there is a, a, a policy position which is called the uh, post-2020 mitigation system that has six elements 
um, six listed elements. One of those elements um, is a carbon tax, which uh, you mentioned. Um, it's not, two things about it, it's not actually um, a pure carbon tax because it has an element of um, emissions trading about it. And it's also not the first um, carbon tax implemented in the country because we've had uh, a tax on motor vehicle emissions for some time and also um, a levy imposed on uh, kilowatt hours of fossil fuel generated power since about 2015. However, the, the uh, instrument called V carbon tax differs in that it is the imposition of a price per ton of CO2E on scope one industrial emissions from the private sector. Um, it follows the um, IPCC uh, guidelines on um, categories of emission sources and effectively the idea is that if you um, own or operate or in control of an emitting facility that conducts one of the uh, those activities so the, the IPCC sources then you are um, potentially liable to carbon tax subject to certain threshold. Um, it's is designed and implemented by National Treasury, but it ties very closely into the National Climate Change Policy, which is um, guided and um, created by the uh, Department of Environmental Affairs, Fisheries and Forestry. And in particular, the uh, Mitigation Subdirectorate of the Climate Directorate under, I'm gonna use the acronym F, Department of Environmental Affairs, Fisheries and, and, and uh, Forestry, so there is a, um, a greenhouse gas reporting legal regime under DEF, uh, which is supposed to be completely congruent with the carbon tax legal regime, and in most instances it is. So the, the mild um, inconsistencies are irrelevant for present purposes. Um, so effectively what is required is that emitting facilities um, measure and report their greenhouse gas emissions to environmental affairs and uh, in, a, in a disaggregated form, so per greenhouse gas emitted, and then in aggregated form, so a total volume of uh, um, emissions, the total volume is subject to um, a price per tonne of CO2 to E emitted, which up until the end of 2019 was 120 rand per ton. So that's approximately five to six euros um, at, at present conversion rates. Um, although that is increasing year on year linked to CPI. Um, although, Will, as you say, the, the act came into operation on the 1st of June, 2019, that's really the first step in quite a uh, complicated, my apologies, there are dogs barking in the background. I'm very excited about being here. Um, the, the Act is the um, sort of foundation, if you like, for a quite complicated regulatory regime, which, among other things, permits the amelioration of a tax liability by up to 95% in, in the first uh, period, um, dependent on certain factors uh, named allowances under the Carbon Tax Act. For example, are you um, applying, are you um, securing carbon offsets? Typically things like um, uh, certified emission reductions from CDM projects. Um, uh, are you trade exposed? Do you have, um, uh, can you prove leakage and the like? Um, the first, uh, tax return is actually due for submission formally in July this year, but um, because of COVID and the declaration of a national disaster in this country, those kind of deadlines are, um, I, I suspect, up for debate again. Um, notwithstanding that, and, and last comment, uh, what South Africa has effectively done has, uh, the country's become the first uh, uh, um, jurisdiction on the African continent to take a formal step to pricing its uh, industrial emissions. Okay, thank you very much for, for providing that overview of the, of the really interesting and important work that's been taking place in South Africa. 
Um, before we move on, um, just in case you haven't seen it, I wanted to, to highlight to the audience that we've launched a poll um, to try to get your perspective on, on um, whether the, what the likelihood is of, of seeing a um, global carbon price by 2030. So please, please take a look at that and enter your answers accordingly. Um, Andrew, just a quick follow-up question. The, um, we know that the, the process and the pathway to implementing carbon taxes is, is different for different countries, but could you explain a little bit in your perspective, I guess, what, what some of the major challenges were in South Africa and if, if there's any learnings that, um, that you could take away from this experience for other emerging economies that might be considering pricing carbon? Um, have different government departments who are responsible for different elements of mitigation policy actually speak to one another. Um, so the overarching policy is delimited by environmental affairs because it is the focal point around climate change um, in, for many years, but, but more formally in 2011, um, in terms of a, uh, a, a climate policy white paper, the Department of Environmental Affairs set out its ambition for a post-2020 mitigation system, and part of that system uh, was always a carbon tax. The, the difficulty that arose is that taxation is the um, purvey of uh, national treasury, and it's, uh, which, which is absolutely fine and acceptable, and treasury went ahead and um, developed the carbon tax legal regime to some degree, and I stand to be corrected by government colleagues who I know are listening to this, um, to some degree in isolation of the trajectory that uh, environmental affairs was taking with the rest of the mitigation system, and most particularly two elements of that system. So um, the reporting that I mentioned to you, and also the notion of uh, the implementation of carbon budgets. So although there's some debate, the idea of a carbon budget uh, in, in the country is understood to be a, 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 a regulated cap on emissions. Um, and there was a lot of discussion around whether um, industries that were subject to both carbon budgets and carbon tax would be required to pay, pay tax on their, um, on their budgets. And the answer at this point is yes, that seems to be the case. Um, but the to answer your question specifically and to go back to my first statement, some of the uh, practical difficulties that we are experiencing now, and I literally mean things like, can I register, sorry, can I uh, apply for licensing of my emission facility um, under the Carbon Tax Act made with something uh, called the Customs and Excise Act? Can I do that in complete congruence with my obligations for reporting as apply uh, um, under the auspices of environmental affairs. And we are finding glitches in that system. Again, glitches are understandable, um, but they may have been uh, less pronounced if there had been a little bit more cooperation between those two sectoral departments. Okay. Yeah, th thank you. That's fantastic. Many, many thanks for, for providing um, sort of those insights into what's happening in South Africa. We'd like to um, sort of travel across the Indian Ocean now to Indonesia and invite Dida Gardera to, to provide an update of what's happening with carbon pricing in Indonesia. So we understand that, you, that Indonesia has opted for an emissions trading system rather than a carbon tax. And would you like to give us um, a bit of the background as to why that choice was made and what the status of the of the instrument's development is in Indonesia. Okay, thank you, William, and good afternoon, everybody, and good evening in Indonesia. Uh, despite the current condition, Indonesia is still committed to the plan of uh, ETS implementation, uh, especially in energy sector, since uh, we already mentioned in our government regulation, the environmental economic instruments, and also the most important ones during inauguration of our new cabinet member in the end of 2019, our president, President Jokowi, emphasized that the carbon trading is one of the, his administration priorities. So Indonesia is moving forward with this plan, which now is in progress. Of course, the 
there are some uh, arrangement adjustment during uh, current situations. Uh, we are still working uh, uh, co uh, with intensively with uh, uh, all the line ministers, uh, line ministries. Yeah, for example, the Ministry of Environment and Forestry is currently developing the draft uh, for uh, more detail uh, carbon pricing, including the emission trading scheme. Uh, yeah, the background of the uh, 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 regulation describe the relevant or institutional and policy frameworks for carbon uh, pricing uh, instrument in Indonesia. So uh, we are very uh, uh, broad. We are still focusing for the piloting, the implementation of ETS. But in this regulation, we will embrace all scheme of uh, carbon pricing, including carbon tax. So we still uh, develop the, the the idea of the policy concepts. Yeah, in a technical level, uh, the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Resources also organized its technical capacity for the preparation of uh, ETS or cap and trade pilot, particularly in a uh, sector of power, electricity generation. <coughs> uh, jointly with the Ministry of Industry, which also preparing the pilot for uh, ETS in the sector of cement and fertilizer. It is planned that the pilot uh, will be uh, uh, used the uh, using approach of voluntary uh, for the implementation of this year. Uh, we are also improving our national MRV system. Uh, now still we already have, but uh, of course there is still room for in improvement. Uh, one uh, the issue is uh, for the MRV system. Uh, normally, we will use uh, uh, field visit, but at the moment, perhaps we will use the uh, existing data. So we still have plan to launch the ETS pilot uh, this year, uh, uh, around September or October, but uh, perhaps not the full uh, ETS implementation, but yeah, uh, at least we recognize the 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 emission reduction uh, for, from all the sectors. Yeah, that's at the moment our progress. Well, um, many thanks, Dita. So great to see such a sort of cross-ministerial effort in the development and conceptualization of this instrument and also very excited to, to hear a provisional timeline for, the, to, for things to get going in September. So um, many thanks for, sh for sharing those um, insights with us and all the best to sort of continue on with that work, particularly even in, in this time with um, some disrupted uh, work with the with the cri corona crisis. Um, we, will, we will come back to the developments in Indonesia in a moment, but I wanted to get um, uh, Beatrice in, involved in the discussion. So the EU ETS is the, is the world's oldest and still largest um, emissions trading system. And it's provided sort of over a decade of experience um, and lessons for EU policymakers, but also policymakers from all over the world in terms of the design of these systems. So now that from the European Commission's perspective, we see we start to see the expansion of, of carbon pricing and emissions trading more globally. What is the, the focus of the of the European Commission in terms of cooperation on carbon pricing? Uh, thanks a lot, William, and uh, hello, everybody. A pleasure to, uh, to be with you electronically and virtually. So just to, uh, to say that, uh, as you mentioned, we are talking about a, a big uh, commodity market, I mean, the biggest environmental, in environmental terms in the world. And uh, we have uh, reinforced our domestic market, as you know, to more ambitious. And uh, just let me uh, drop you that last year, so 2019, before the, this uh, unfortunate corona crisis, we have uh, reduced in stationary installations, and I'm talking about 11,000 installations, 8% of the emissions, with uh, economic growth of 1.5%. So it's in impressive, this decoupling, and this uh, has been a part of uh, the reinforcement that Council and Parliaments of the European Union has done on the emission trading, and also they put in place so the market stability reserve, that mechanism 
that takes out of the market the, the excess of supply. So domestically, uh, the cabo market is working, I would say, rather well. It's uh, not just to make some advertisement, but it's a, a good internal in, to internalize. It has internalized externalities of the economy that even if it's a horrible sentence, it has been something revolutionary. And uh, also in these uh, unfortunate times of Corona, prices have dropped. I mean, but uh, not, uh, not uh, demolished. We are in 21 euros uh, per ton. So market is, is working. So how we work in this uh, external action? As uh, you know, our main ambition, as uh, we have different phases as the European Union, I mean, different phases like we are the biggest donor in the world. So for us, the Big South is a clear priority of uh, working together with uh, third countries, and this will keep it. Uh, second big priority is, of course, to do a proper climate uh, change policy. I mean, you mentioned before, the, the climate diplomacy. So we go strongly, very strongly working with all our 100 and uh, more than 120 delegations of the European Union all over the world in working of this climate cooperation. Uh, we have uh, more concrete cases and in more concrete cases on um, how we work and how we are collaborating uh, carbon pricing. Uh, it comes to my mind, of course, China. We have a strong bilateral cooperation with them. It comes to my mind New Zealand, it comes to my mind California, and of course Switzerland, that we have established uh, the first uh, linking agreement uh, this year that uh, we, are, we are connecting to them. So uh, for us, it's, there's not this binary uh, vision of the world in developing and developed countries. Depends on the different, uh, different uh, situations and different uh, policies, different uh, capacities of monitoring. And uh, for us, the carbon pricing is a very good tool. And uh, I think that there's no binary discussion. Is it better a tax for carbon pricing? What is uh, better? I think that we all know that we are working with a set of policies, whatever they are called, renewable energies, whatever energy efficiency, some taxation, and clearly carbon pricing is uh, for us a, a very important tool. So um, a priority inside the, the climate cooperation, I would say. Okay, many thanks, um, Beatrice, and also for, for reminding us um, very succinctly really what the what the purpose of this um, policy tool is that we're talking about. So carbon pricing to actually price an externality that is, is currently not included in consumption and production decisions in jurisdictions that do not have a carbon price, which results in too many emissions than what is desirable for, for our planet. So um, this is an excellent sort of um, basis now for, for a broader discussion. And the, the, the key topic that we wanted to, to put forward today is really the cooperation on carbon pricing. And so many thanks to, to everybody for submitting your answers to, to the polls. Um, I'm just going to think that I have uh, published those responses now so that you can all see them. And I would do that just before um, turning to, to Luca. So, Luca, you have um, dedicated a, a lot of your career to basically understanding the opportunities and challenges from cooperating um, carbon pricing and actually linking emission trading systems. Um, maybe you can give us just a two-minute summary of your life's work. Yeah, <laughs> or, or perhaps more, more directly, the, the opportunities and challenges from your perspective in terms of cooperation. Hello. So over to you, Luca. Okay, thanks a lot. Sorry, I couldn't hear you very well. Um, so f first, uh, good morning, afternoon, and evenings to everyone. Thanks a lot for giving me the opportunity to uh, discuss here. It's refreshing to see that the polls uh, give us 69% of uh, a possibility or likelihood of a unified global carbon pricing at least uh, from a developer, uh, uh, among developed countries. So let me try to tell you more about my work and uh, that is related, or related to the why, why cooperation uh, and in particular interconnection of carbon markets matter and how it may be uh, uh, concretely be, uh, become a reality in the future. Uh, so at the moment, most of the existing 
um, ATNs uh, um, are disconnected. Uh, for the most part, you cannot trade uh, permits across the different uh, systems. So basically, technically, systems are not linked. When we think and talk in terms of linking, we mean the formal recognitions by one program of emission reduction that are undertaken in another uh, uh, jurisdiction uh, for the purpose of uh, uh, compliance. So it's a it's a formal recognition of a, an allowance basically created in one system and be used for compliance uh, in another. So when you think in terms of uh, linkage, you are basically linking the cap, you're linking the, the, the targets uh, that uh, you have in, in all the systems that are interconnected. And there are clearly economic and political motivations uh, for uh, linking. Um, the economic, the, the most important economic uh, motivation is you achieve uh, cost of effectiveness um, uh, or better cost of effectiveness, meaning you can achieve lower costs of emission reductions across the set of the linked systems, uh, meaning that uh, costs are uh, lower in both the system for individual jurisdiction, for the individual cap, and also for the uh, collective um, uh, cap. By uh, linking, uh, perhaps obvious, uh, but very important, uh, you increase the level of uh, the numbers of participants. So you have a higher, well, I would call market liquidity, so larger number of players um, in the system. And to a, some degree, uh, when linkage reduced the carbon price differential across the different countries or regions, well, that reduction of the, of the price wedge also reduced the potential for more competitive distortions caused by leakage. So those are the, I would say, key paramount uh, economic uh, motivations. Uh, there are also political advantages. Uh, the first is that, uh, by starting or, uh, or negotiating from a cooperative uh, uh, perspective uh, a debate about integration of uh, carbon markets, you can actually influence uh, those nations that are unlinked. Uh, you can probably encourage them to take uh, actions in terms of uh, um, uh, climate, uh, climate change. And also by linking, I would say there are political and again, partially economic uh, benefits, uh, administrative benefits in a way um, that you will start sharing basically uh, experience in terms of uh, design and operation. And that burden, that hurdle in terms of costs will be minimized uh, when you tag along, basically you tap into uh, a system that has already uh, a DTS in place. So those are, I think the major economic and political motivations based on the work and research we've been doing. And um, so you touched on the, the survey results there. Um, what's your own perspective? Do you think that we will see a significant number of linked systems over the next, say, uh, 10 years? Uh, it's a very good question. I think it's a really, really good question. I think it's related to um, one, again, connected to the political motivation. I think it's connected to the political leadership and mutual trust among the different uh, systems. So the current existing systems that are linked are those systems that share a certain level of uh, institutional systems, what I, what I would call institutional proximity. Uh, so I, I believe that a key element for the success of a linking um, uh, outcome is mutual trust and the fact that there is obviously there is a requirement of an ongoing process of political dialogue, uh, dialogue and cooperation. So Quebec and California building their system on a mutual platform, what is called the Western Climate uh, Initiative, but also they have clear institutional proximity. They are very similar. So I would expect this to happen, not just frankly at the developed level, not just among developed countries, but also among developing countries. So there is, this is, I think, related to the debate about uh, the clubs of, uh, uh, of carbon markets. So you might see in the global south system uh, uh, whereby, for example, Indonesia could be linked to other uh, uh, countries in, in Asia that share similar elements, similar institutional um, uh, elements. 
So now perhaps uh, following directly on to that a question to, to Dita. So it's it's early days in the development of um, of your carbon pricing mechanism, but is cooperation um, with other sort of um, neighbors in within the Asia Pacific or even um, as far as the EU something that's um, being discussed or considered in, in Indonesia? Yeah, thank you, William. Yeah, we still currently focus on our domestic carbon pricing, but we are developing in a way that we enable linkage in the features. Uh, yeah, for example, by using international standard principle, internationally acceptable methodologies, and etc. We have started identifying potential international cooperation on carbon pricing with several uh, uh, multilateral organizations uh, and also bilaterally with uh, some countries. Uh, yeah, uh, we have uh, already engaged to develop the the cooperation with them. Uh, but yeah, perhaps uh, come up to our mind to have a kind of a regional carbon pricing, but still, uh, yeah, it's very premature. We, we, we talk about that, but uh, we still focus on the uh, uh, domestic carbon pricing. And also, yeah, hopefully uh, not in the uh, very long, uh, we can have uh, uh, Article 6. So, so I think, yeah, uh, we try to uh, exercise uh, the carbon uh, uh, pricing uh, internationally, both bilateral and multilateral. Thank you, Dita. And um, coming back to, to Africa, Andrew, what's what sort of um, what's the perspective there for cooperation on carbon pricing? I mean, do do you see carbon pricing as even a, a realistic or perhaps appropriate uh, policy instrument for 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 some countries um, within Africa? Uh, yes, very definitely, and it's certainly um, on the agenda of of uh, most countries. On the continent. So, for example, we've done two studies, one for uh, the UNFCCC and UNEP, and the other for CUS, as it happens, um, looking at the, the policies and the, the legal uh, frameworks in various countries, um, particularly around carbon pricing. So, there are, there are a couple of interesting things that, that arise from that. First of all, um, if you uh, analyze the uh, nationally determined contributions from most African countries, um, among the statements made in those contributions is a strong assertion of uh, that country and so consequently you kind of unmask the continent's interest in the future of the carbon market. The way that interest is expressed in the NDCs because they date to um, prior to the Paris Agreement, remember they were submitted in advance of Paris, uh, for that reason the statements are um, very much focused on, let's call it the, the, the traditional approach. So um, project-based under the uh, clean de development mechanism and, and the like. So there's a strong statement that um, Africa wants to be part of the discussion. And by the way, that's also a policy position of the African group of negotiators. If we dig a little bit deeper into that question, um, the issue of what are appropriate carbon pricing mechanisms for different uh, developing and least developed countries in Africa is slightly more nuanced. And this ties to your question on, on linking. I'll make a broad kind of African statement if you like and then, and then mention South Africa. So, and I tie this by the way to the poll, which I see is relatively pe kind of pessimistic around um, the idea of linkage and, and a, a global carbon price. I tend to the response, the first element of that response, which is a sort of tentative optimism because certain discussion, you know, the, the discussion has already commenced and Africa is absolutely part of that discussion. Um, the discussion at the moment is, and, and forgive this, it's relatively one dimensional from the perspective of what is an appropriate mechanism to price carbon because um, that one dimensionality arises from the notion that um, if you like, and again, apologies for this term, it's my own, um, the default mechanisms to do that are either 
carbon taxation or ETS. Um, that belies the generality of the idea of carbon pricing mechanisms per se. The point being that whether you, uh, the, the, if you are going to implement uh, um, ETS or carbon taxation in a particular economy, there are probably certain factors about that economy and that jurisdiction that need to be in place before those options become um, appropriate or viable. That is not to say that in the absence of those options being appropriate or viable, you can't price carbon in those economies. Um, for example, and, and we won't delve into this, but um, under the Article 6 mechanisms uh, of the Paris Agreement, and in terms of the idea of internationally transferable, the transferable mitigation options, part of that discussion is um, characterizing the carbon value of an economy, even if that value is the sink capacity of um, um, a forest, for example. So of characterizing that carbon value in a potential volume of tons of CO2e, applying a, an indicative, um, perhaps international carbon price to that, uh, uh, to that volume, and consequently deriving a previously non-existent um, economic asset, if you like, that, that the country now is able to access, and it can access that because of its participation in the international regime. Um, so the, you, you, the answer to your question, Will, is that, yes, of course, Africa is viable and, and able to do this. The, the question is, um, what is appropriate in the given circumstances? And can we align the metrics of something like ETS and carbon taxation with uh, the metrics that can be derived from something like red and red plus. Um, last, but very, very sort of short thought on the South African uh, position. I suspect that it's it's kind of subliminally part, the linkage is subliminally part of um, the, uh, the country's negotiation position. But I, I will say to you that um, we are currently working with um, various quite important government departments who have responsibility for various of these ideas. And in those discussions, conducted informally, um, there is certainly the notion of the carbon tax, which is intended to um, price and, and cause a reduction in emissions, measurable reduction in emissions, measured in tons of CO2e. And for, for that reduction to be uh, reported under Paris um, as part of, uh, uh, you know, towards a, a achieving the, uh, the ambition under the, the NDC, um, and so therefore tying back to the international regime. So, so therein lies a kind of implied uh, um, linkage without necessarily the idea of a linkage between emission, system, emission trading systems. Yeah, many, many thanks, Andrew, and also for, for sort of reminding us here that there's um, different forms of cooperation on carbon pricing, and this, this might not always be a, a direct and bilateral link between emission trading systems, but um, sort of different, different degrees, as it's been put, of, of cooperation. Um, so for the participants, I'd like to now launch the, another poll as we sort of move um, back to the, to the EU um, before also asking um, Beatrice so the um, last year, the European Green Deal was announced. And I was wondering if you could share with us what the implications of this are for the EU ETS and whether it provides any um, opportunities for, for countries from the global south. Well, I think that uh, Green Deal is, a, is a, a change of a scale. You see, that it's a game change. We have been, uh, as a European Union, uh, pioneers in, uh, in renewable energies and pioneers in the carbon pricing. And I think that now is uh, a clear, more ambitious, is uh, transversally integrated in the whole economy. And as uh, we mentioned in the European Green Deal, as our president has repeatedly said, uh, we are preparing the work to uh, achieve a reduction of CO2 of, in the range of 50, 55% for 2030. So, this, of course, uh, we will have uh, uh, 
different degrees of cooperation with uh, the global south. So uh, we are, and this our 50-55%, just to clarify and distinguish, our 50-55% is, uh, is uh, thought domestically. So we are talking about an European Union objective. Other thing is that uh, we are uh, larger cooperators with, uh, as a donor, as uh, different degrees of, uh, of uh, relations, as uh, uh, different, of course, uh, engage with the UNFCCC negotiations. But uh, if, what, if I can say what are the implications for the, for the Big South is that uh, we, are, we are, we want to have to become the first uh, decarbonized economy in the world. And this includes also the external dimension. So in all our uh, different fronts of uh, cooperation, whatever it's multilateral, whatever it's bilateral, whatever it's as a donor, whatever it is the, the foreign policy instruments, whatever different uh, phases of the whole external policy, it will have our influence. I mean, we have, if I could say, is uh, climate is not a, a, a policy in a corner, even if it was never in a corner in the last year of the Commission, but now it's at the heart of its policy. So all the fronts of our cooperation, including Global South cooperation, will be affected by the Green Deal. Okay, many thanks. And um, a question which um, I know is coming up a lot um, in many different sort of forums is that of leveling at the border. So we've seen already some questions posed in the, in the Q&A box, but um, what is the, um, can you tell us anything further about the Commission's approach to, to border carbon adjustments and what role these may play in the future? So the, the border adjustment, it was uh, also announced uh, as part of the Green Deal. And uh, it's, the idea is every country in the world should have a climate ambition. So this is the, the, the base. Every country should have this climate ambition. And then you have a fair competition between countries, meaning that uh, we cannot have and an, an work together with countries that some of them internalize the carbon pricing and others do not internalize this carbon price in the economy. So we are not talking about protectionism. We are not talking about uh, umbrella uh, covering of our industry. We are talking about fairness. And, uh, and this fairness includes the internalization, how they internalize, and of course, to follow all the world trade um, orthodoxy on a, on a proper trade uh, multilateral, because as you, um, I, I will need to repeat, that we are uh, a clearly a global player as European Union. So from a process point of view, the uh, president has announced it, it's part of the Green Deal. It has been uh, a rather polemic or uh, very, I mean, taken by the press. And I think that it's good, it's very good that we put in the trade discussions, the climate aspects. So I'm, I'm very happy of this, uh, of this uh, noise, if I could say. I'm very happy of this debate because we are putting in the real economy. So the moment that we are uh, reaching the real economy, things change. From a process point of view, uh, we have uh, launched the impact assessment for non-Europeans. Of course, this is a normal decision making. So it's a mix of a study and a mix of uh, public consultation. And I invite you all to contribute to this public consultation. And we will be uh, uh, presenting, so we see it for our, our upcoming year, we are presenting this uh, carbon border adjustment. But as I said, we, are, we have already started to work on it. Okay, many, many thanks Beatrice. And um, I guess an, an open question to, to either Andrew or to Dida. Um, how would you react to the, to the sort of the, the Green New Deal that has been um, put forward by, by the European Commission and, and specifically the, um, the issue of border carbon adjustments? So, um, if I may, um, there's there's a regular kind of debate in this country that, that goes, um, we don't contribute very significantly internationally to uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and so why should we bother to mitigate, let America and China do that? Um, so that misses a, a number of factors. Firstly, um, the country contributes approximately 1% internationally to greenhouse gas emissions. And there are not many countries, there are possibly about five or six countries that contribute more than 5% of the global total. So that puts us fairly high. 
Um, notwithstanding that, the country is also about 14th, the 14th highest emitter, emitter from a per capita perspective. And uh, this is this ties to the question. Um, the economy is incredibly carbon intense because 80% of the electricity is still generated from fossil fuels. Um, the idea of border tax adjustments is particularly concerning for trade in this country because, um, you know, to some degree, we're a manufacturing economy. And so the imposition of border tax adjustments will make us increasingly uncompetitive as we move on. Um, so, I, I mean, I suspect it's, it's, a, it's an issue that um, the Department of Foreign Affairs is, is particularly concerned about. So it isn't very much an issue for South Africa. Uh, Dita, did you want to provide a comment at this point? Yeah, uh, thank you, William, for the questions. Yeah, I think uh, we have to uh, see the the real situation. Uh, uh, but yeah, uh, I think uh, we have to uh, adjust all. Uh, uh, regarding the current situation, but I think uh, the most important uh, things we have to uh, keep our commitment uh, and try to use uh, all the possible um, mechanism. Yeah, at the end, uh, all the country have to work together and have to build a, a common consensus, I think. Many, many thanks, Dido. Um, so, I would like to, to move on a little bit in the discussion. I'm, I'm um, keeping an eye on time because I, I want to make sure that we do have plen plenty of time to engage with our audience in the, in the Q&A. So, um, I mean, it's, we, we can't sort of ignore the, the fact that we are, we are holding this discussion um, online with most of us sitting at home in our houses. and. Uh, COVID-19 has had an unprecedented impact on, on our lives and also our, our economies and carbon markets have not been sort of spared from, from that. And so I wanted to, to ask Luca um, whether he can give us his, his perspective on, on what the impact um, and likely future impact of COVID-19 will be on, on carbon markets. So Luca? Yeah, so uh, thanks for the uh, prompt. Uh, cannot predict the future, but obviously I think that we can all recognize that priorities have clearly shifted uh, during this uh, coronavirus pandemic, uh, actually for both uh, uh, society, uh, but also national and international agencies and clearly also industries. Um, I've been reading uh, airlines uh, suggesting to postpone uh, taxes, uh, uh, green taxes on aviations. I've been reading uh, German, German government uh, thinking whether they should postpone the launch of the German ETS on transportation and uh, heating emissions. So obviously uh, priorities uh, have changed. Um, I also think we should all, all recognize that there is a mounting pressure on in particular uh, national but also international institution to tie the post coronavirus stimulus packages uh, with a, a different form of uh, uh, economic incentives. Uh, in particular, I, I, in Europe, uh, we see that there is a mounting pressure on the EU institution to link this to the EU Green uh, Green Deal. So I, I think that there are two possible <laughs> scenarios. One scenario where uh, everything gets, uh, it's like a pause uh, and most of the things will be pushed forward and we will maybe uh, pick up again all the conversation about uh, international carbon pricing in general and i would like to make a point uh, in response to andrew uh, in, in carbon pricing instruments in general in a couple of years or we take this as a great opportunity to link tie up um, uh, carbon pricing and different other forms of uh, pricing instruments market instruments uh, to the uh, to, to the different economic stimulus packages and um, yeah, many thanks for sort of peering into your crystal ball um, on those issues, Luca. And I was also um, curious about the, let's say, the um, more established um, emission trading system. So we've seen a financial crisis that's that sort of um, turned into an economic crisis and the impact that had on the EU ETS. 
Do you expect um, a sort of similar fallout um, with, with COVID-19? I, 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 you know, we recently wrote a blog. Uh, we, we've got a lot of uh, uh, emails about this. Um, I, I don't know. I wouldn't take, uh, uh, this is clearly a, a massive shock uh, to the economy that obviously will significantly reduce instantaneous demand for emissions. And we observed, I think, four or five weeks ago, uh, a price, EU prices, EU allowance prices uh, tanking. Uh, to low levels of price, but that price picked up quite quickly again. And this is absolutely uh, not necessarily due to any sort of current existing mechanism. And I'm referring to what we have here in Europe, uh, a, a rule-based mechanism, so-called market stability reserve. The, the, perhaps the expectation of that mechanism kicking in at some point in the future uh, increased the demand. So the prices went up again. I believe that uh, this gives us an opportunity to again reconsider the role of um, mechanisms like this. Every system, probably market-based system that is not a tax, should have a, a mechanism, a similar mechanism, something that can provide a bit more of uh, robustness. Um, and on top of everything, uh, this is a long game. I mean, the fact that uh, currently emissions are demand for permits, let us phrase it like that, is low. It doesn't mean that uh, demand will remain systematically low forever. So yeah, there is a, a, some sort of inter, intertemporal connection uh, in, in, the, in every uh, carbon market. Okay, Luca, thank you very much. And for anybody that would like sort of more, more information on that, I would encourage you to sort of head along to Luca's website and, and, and read the blog that he was mentioning. Um, so we are sort of drawing to a close of the of the more formal session now. You'll see that we have launched another poll, um, and this is on the impact of COVID-19 on the um, attention of policymakers towards climate issues. And I would just like to, to sort of close with one, one final question to all of our um, panelists to ask, so what what do you see as the impact of, of, the, of COVID-19 on um, climate ambition? So, do we do you see this as um, the fact that COP26 has been postponed, that we will sort of have a delay in the ratcheting up of ambition? Or is there actually a silver lining that might come out of the of the stimulus and an opportunity to take a sort of real real look into the structure of the of our economies and prepare for moving towards net zero? Um, Beatrice, perhaps we can start with you. Hello. So I think that, uh, well, this, uh, this uh, terrible crisis that uh, we are living, it's uh, at the same time is injecting an enormous, you will need to inject, uh, and we are starting to do it, an, an enormous uh, economic package. We are having, uh, as uh, Luca was mentioning, some mechanisms. We are talking about the enormous, I mean, the order of trillions of, uh, of uh, in lending and injections in liquidity. So, uh, what, one thing that I can one thing that I can say is that uh, green and digital aspects, these two important legs, will be part of the recovery. I mean, the, this is not that we are just putting aside the the climate package, saying now we are concentrating on serious things. Of course, the upside down of the economy and the terrible situation that many companies include. We will need a, a political answer. But we are working on that, also finding ways that we are not locking in investments. So we are not going to do a re-business as usual for them to uh, try to act. So I'm sure that there will come many changes that we cannot imagine in this uh, in injection package. But uh, just uh, as we are in the, in the also just to, to, to mention that the commission is working on that, but it is uh, important that the council uh, pick up all these opportunities of uh, even if it's the, the a terrible situation they are opportunities for investment in green technologies there will be opportunities for internalizing and there will be also uh, green business uh, coming up for this uh, new era i'm sure for that excellent um, many thanks for for that um those perspectives and sort of somewhat of a positive take on on the um as Beatrice, did you like William. to say something else? Yeah. 
Yeah, sorry, William. I'm, I'm raising the old-fashioned hand. <laughs> uh, just to say that uh, what I can say is that uh, uh, we were uh, at uh, 15, 16 euro per ton and that uh, the market is resisting all this uh, financial crisis. So we have a price of 21 euro, which is good that you see the reflection that prices goes down with the context, but it's, uh, it's uh, keeping a, a good business and a good, uh, I mean, it's sustainable for the financial point of view also. Yes, thank you, many thanks. Um, so maybe over to, to Dita now, the, um, you're somebody that I know has worked very, very hard in the, in the um, negotiations surrounding in, um, a mechanism for an um, international carbon market. So what's your take on the disruptions of COVID-19 um, and perhaps in particular to the, the fact that COP is now being postponed and what impact this might have on, on um, the rule book for Article 6? Yes, uh, thank you. Yeah, COVID-19 is the most uh, critical threat that facing uh, uh, to us today. But we cannot forget that the climate change is the biggest threat facing humanity over the long term. Indeed, the outbreak will have a profound and lasting economic and social consequences around the globe. But soon, uh, economies will restart and at the moment, we can feel and see that the, the condition of environment is uh, much better. So I, I, I hope that this situation can inspire to all, of, to all of us to maintain our commitment uh, in the climate change, uh, 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 including the climate change negotiation for Article 6. I think, yeah, perhaps uh, there will be some uh, delay or postpone, but I think, I believe that the, our commitment uh, uh, around the world still high for uh, uh, to, to reduce uh, the emissions. Okay, many, many thanks, Lita. And Andrew, um, would you like to provide us sort of with your perspective on, on the, the balancing of the, I guess, the impacts of COVID-19 in the recovery? Uh, sure, in fact, we're about to do a piece of work on exactly this issue. So, um, cancelling a COP is not a, is not a good sign. Um, uh, various, of, I mean, the technology exists, we're using some of it now, um, certainly for uh, some of the technical meetings to have continued um, and to progress the issues. Remember, this is, this is the, I mean, it was being um, hailed as a kind of a mega COP. Um, uh, in order to settle things like transparency on six and the review of the NBCs. Um, again, again, referring to your poll, I, I again um, I go with a slightly more pessimistic view. Um, in the past, humanity has not learned from uh, similar uh, instances. So the, the two most important um, kind of economic downturns that have occurred prior to COVID were 9-11 and the 2008 crash. Both of them saw a reduction in economic activity and consequently greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, but in the aftermath, there was a spike in, in uh, those emissions. Now, um, there is some discussion around the idea that uh, we could learn from COVID and uh, drive um, further and increased investment in green energies and the Green New Deal and the like. Um, but uh, the, the signs are not good that that's going to happen. And just to contextualize the idea that um, COVID is causing a reduction in emissions and so we can you know, somehow take our foot off the climate change accelerator. Um, carbon Pulse, which is a, a, um, you know, a, a carbon market related uh, um, information source, recently did a, 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 a high level study and they determined that, sorry, if I'm not looking at, this, at, at the camera, I'm looking at another screen. Uh, they determined that um, it's possible that COVID will result in a reduction of 4% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions for 2019. But one has to understand that in the context of the long-term uh, uh, goal um, or under the Paris Agreement, which is a 1.5 degree world, right? That requires a 6% reduction year on year, every year this decade. So um, COVID is, is a lesson from which we can learn, um, but is a, it is a lesson that emphasizes we've got to um, um, ramp up our climate efforts, including price.
Will, we cannot hear you. <laughs> Sorry. Many, many thanks, Andrew, for also putting, um, putting the debate in the context of some numbers um, for us. So just a quick reminder to everybody to, to please use the question and answer box. Um, we're about to turn to the Q&A and it would be great to, if um, basically if you have any questions for any of our panelists to put them in there now. Um, and then we will uh, also remind you to, to put your, your name and your affiliation and then we will um, get to these questions during the discussion. And so now um, just would like to give the, the floor to Luca for any sort of closing remarks, um, particularly around this, I guess, this, this um, debate around COVID-19 and the recovery. Oh, I, I liked uh, a lot how Andy put it uh, uh, and building on the figures that uh, he mentioned. It's very, it's interesting to see that exactly we look at these as a, dramatic economic shock due to COVID that caused a 4%, I'm just uh, re-quoting figures, but we need, if we were serious, if we were going to take seriously the cap that we have in mind looking forward in 2030, 2040, 2050, it probably corresponds to an equally divide 6% year on year. So yeah, it's, it put things uh, into, into uh, perspective. So I think it's a, it's a very interesting uh, number to keep in mind. And so open question from me to the, to the panel, Does, is there a role for, for carbon pricing and particularly cooperation on carbon pricing as we implement um, the, some of the recovery measures and we sort of move out of this COVID-19 crisis? Perhaps, uh, I'm sorry, Andrew. I, I think there is definitely a role for uh, carbon pricing and uh, it's uh, Andrew and both Andrew and Dita uh, testify that it's a testimony of the fact that uh, there is an ongoing debate about uh, how to implement these uh, in Indonesia, Asia and uh, in uh, Africa as well. So definitely there will be and there is a debate about carbon pricing at the moment. Uh, if I can link this to what Andrew was also mentioning. I think the debate now is moving more towards the role, the role of carbon pricing instruments more in general and the readiness of some countries to adopt this type of, uh, um, this type of instrument, instrument. It is clear that when you compare taxes and carbon markets, there is a distinction between simplicity versus flexibility, I would say. So carbon taxes can be way easier to implement uh, because they do often uh, use the established channels uh, of the tax uh, system. Whereas, so you basically have already an infrastructure in place. Whereas for a carbon markets, you need to build that infrastructure. infrastructure. And that's, I think, uh, connects to what Andy was saying. Is there, is, is the system ready uh, for this type of uh, higher level of complexity? Though this is much more uh, this is much more flexible. And connected to the debate of uh, linking, it is true that uh, at the moment we observe um, different systems. So we have carbon taxes and we have carbon markets present. And it's, as you, as you, you will were suggesting, it is possible uh, to connect carbon taxes to carbon market, but we also need to recognize that it, this, is a, this is a real challenge. So it's much more complicated than start negotiation of linking absolute uh, cap, uh, carbon markets, basically. Okay, um, many thanks. So we do have a few questions um, coming through now, and one particularly on carbon revenues. So the, the first is a broad question, I think, to the panel from, from Josh Burke. Um, as to whether carbon revenues can actually play a role in the, the COVID response. So as Bea mentioned, we're talking huge amounts of money that is going to be injected into the, uh, into the economy. And the question is, where is this coming from? And can um, carbon markets play a role or carbon revenues play a role in actually financing some of this? And related to that, a question to both Dida and Andrew as to are there any thoughts or expectations on what the revenue from um, carbon pricing in your jurisdictions could be used for. So I'll hand to, to Bear first. Okay, it's um, something that is, as uh, uh, I said before, that, that uh, carbon 
writing is uh, to internalize this externality. For me, this is the first beauty. The second beauty is that you can um, fine tune or reorient all the revenues or the carbon leakage or the um, innovation investment. You can, or cohesion purposes uh, or solidarity purposes, you can reorient or design your carbon pricing in the, in the way you want, which is uh, also its beauty. Uh, uh, the, the numbers in revenues in the European Union are rather impressive. Only last year there were 14 billion euros uh, raised by uh, member states uh, on uh, carbon pricing. Can we use these uh, member states' revenues for green recovery? They can. They can do it. They have, uh, we have by an obligation of a 50% minimum to invest in climate change. They are currently de facto investing 80%, even if the 80% is not homogeneous. So I think the answer is yes, member states can use the revenues to do a green recovery. And Thank I you. encourage them to do it. <laughs> Many thanks. Um, and to Andrew, a question to you. Is there, how um, does South Africa intend to use the revenue that's collected through the carbon tax? Uh, um, a sticky question. Um, as early as 2006, in a discussion paper on environmental fiscal reform in the country, uh, when uh, carbon tax was first uh, um, comprehensively discussed uh, as part of a suite of fiscal mechanisms, uh, there was a very clear statement by Treasury that the idea of ring fencing um, uh, carbon revenues or, or revenues uh, uh, deriving from uh, carbon tax uh, would go into the, the general fund and be part of the fiscus to be applied by Treasury as it, as it requires. Now, there's a, there's a lot of sense to that if you speak to Treasury officials because uh, government needs to be flexible and have the funds available in order to deal with issues as they arise. Um, unsurprisingly, that uh, received a lot of criticism from uh, industry uh, during the kind of 14 years of development of this regime. Um, and that, that criticism was around uh, what you need to be doing with these revenues is earmarking them and then recycling them into the economy to support um, renewable energy development and the like. And in fact, that position was supported by a, uh, a comprehensive um, tax study uh, led by a very senior judge in the country. Um, Treasury's position changed slightly over the course of the period and the it got to the point where the, where treasury was was saying all right well what we could do with carbon revenues is uh we could replace um using the carbon revenues the uh, uh um energy efficient rebate uh, income tax rebate that is provided in terms of the income tax act um that position i think has since again slightly modulated back to the idea of um, no ring fencing um, but but nonetheless um, the, the, the the question of what to do with those revenues is is particularly important and a very sensitive issue in the country um, the, the status quo at the moment is they go into the general fund and last statement on health and COVID there was a, a rather curious a document that uh, appeared published by the Department of Health some years ago, um, literally tangential to any other debate that, that suggested that carbon tax revenues could be used to support a national health fund in the country. Um, don't know where that came from, um, and I haven't seen a uh, mention of that before uh, since then. So. Many, many thanks, Andrew. Dido, please. Yeah, uh, in, in Indonesia, we have experienced the fossil fuel subsidies reduction. So mostly the, uh, the revenue uh, for the social investment. Uh, now we are working on uh, uh, to develop uh, what we call is a climate change budget tagging. And also we just develop one uh, environmental fund so hopefully yeah, all the revenue come from the carbon could be back to the green investment or climate uh, investment. 
Okay, many thanks. Um, sort of changing direction of the discussion here a little bit, we, we have a question from um, Raymond Zimon from the CDU Economics Council. Um, so I, I think if, I, if I'm stating the question correctly, it's, it's about building up trust um, in terms of linking emission trading systems and how can we actually ensure that emissions are monitored um, and reported uh, to the same level of satisfaction across different countries to be comfortable enough to move forward with a, with a link. So um, I guess Beatrice says um, the European Commission has experience in actually developing linking agreements. Could you provide a perspective on what role sort of um, shared understanding and trust in MRV plays there? Well, of course, the uh, one thing is uh, cooperation, which is uh, Another step, as we will have, we have now in China, what is uh, exchange uh, technical information, uh, support each other. So it's a, a very intense bilateral cooperation. Another thing is the Swiss linking. Mutual trust is a sine qua non uh, condition. So uh, we absolutely need a, a, a mutual trust uh, before the two systems, and we have this with Switzerland. But then the, you have a lot of uh, details that uh, that you need to clarify, like uh, MRV, as I mean the monitoring and reporting, as uh, you mentioned, William. But not only that, of course, similar ambition. It's uh, also to construct together. I mean that the future you are go going to grow in this ambition is it's not that just you just link and then two years after you abandon. Is that uh, you need to have a, a similar system of fines? Is that uh, you need to have a, a market oversight because we are talking about financial markets. So there are different steps. Monitoring, common ambition, I will put, I will say the other way around, common ambition and then monitoring are the two more important pillars. Of course, mutual trust goes there. But you have many mechanics in the linking that uh, you need to, I'm, I'm talking about linking non-cooperation, that you need to put in place. Okay, thank you, Bea. Um, so a question now also from uh, Vicky Pollard from, uh, I believe, DG Klima at the European Commission. So I would ask this question initially to, to Dita and to, to Andrew. So what can the European Union actually do to assi assist you in the um, implementation and operation of your um, carbon pricing systems? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, Indonesia right now already engaged with uh, EU member countries uh, for developing the cooperation. Yeah, uh, mostly we expect uh, to have a cooperation in capacity building. Uh, and of, of course, one of them also to exercise uh, Article 6. Uh, of course, without uh, uh, binding commitment yet for the ITMOS, but we exercise uh, 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 how to implement if the Article 6 already agreed, uh, in uh, particularly uh, in for Article 62, uh, bilateral cooperation. <coughs> so, yeah, we, 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 we develop uh, how, how to build the MRV system, the uh, and the, all the modalities uh, for doing the the carbon trading, um, yeah. But uh, we still have uh, put behind the commitment of the transfer. We still waiting the Article Six, but we already uh, exercise uh, to develop the the system, the the mechanism. Um, if, if I may, so the South African carbon tax is um, is an animal very much contained within South African law. So it flows from uh, South African tax law, and even where it touches um, the, the the sort of the international space in in terms of the use of offsets, um, uh, CERs under the CEM, for example, those the projects generating those offsets have to be located in South Africa. Um, to to uh, support what he has just said, um, the, 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 the system of reporting under Paris um, needs to be clarified so that the, uh, the mitigation uh, actually caused as a result of the carbon tax can be 
formally and correctly characterized under the NDC and reported. If I may pick up uh, the earlier point that I made and speak from the broader perspective of, of the continent, what the EU can absolutely do is to um, look at this idea of what are appropriate carbon pricing mechanisms for different countries um, with a view to um, creating or establishing, if you like, an equivalence or a fungibility between the, um, the value, the carbon value or the carbon asset created in a particular country and carbon assets created in other countries under more established and more formally recognized carbon pricing mechanisms like carbon tax and ETS. So for example, is a ton of CO2E mitigate as a result of RED plus um, equivalent to um, a ton of CO2 e mitigated under um, a, a carbon taxation system. Uh, the, the, the EU ETS tells us yes, um, uh, it can work. Um, so that idea needs to be transposed into the international region. Okay, Andrew, th many thanks. And so we are almost out of time now. So I would just take the, the last question. Um, from Josh Burke from um, LSE, the, the Grantham Center, to um, it's about the basically the, the use of carbon revenues and and whether we're getting the balance right between um, earmarking these for for industry and other investments or as a payment in a dividend to citizens. And so, I wondered whether um, any of our panelists would like to comment on this. And I guess also in the context of sort of potentially increasing revenues going forward as we see carbon prices potentially rising over into the future and also the, the scope and scale of our, of our emission trading systems increasing. Uh, if I may, as I mentioned, there's an energy efficiency uh, rebate on income tax for uh, companies that, that uh, um, retrofit, if you like, uh, uh, their existing facilities with energy efficiency equipment. Um, uh, it's an amount of 95 cents, South African cents per kilowatt hour of energy saved. So that's not a direct payment of a dividend to a citizen, but it is certainly a direct application of um, government funding, which could potentially be carbon revenue to assist in um, green activities, if you like. Thank you, Andrew. I think it's already uh, mentioned that uh, the revenue from carbon pricing should uh, back to green investment, but it is not only uh, done by the government, but also all stakeholders, I think. So I, I agree it can be used also for the industry or the uh, public or community, uh, I think, is uh, uh, to encourage or to promote them also to uh, participate, in, participate in the uh, uh, emission reduction. Thank you, Dieter. Yeah. Uh, William, if I, if I could uh, say, I think that uh, the, uh, I think my personal answer should be for both. And uh, it's not a division between citizen and industry. I mean, we are, I think that what is important is the revenues used for climate policy in a large sense. And this climate policy can be greener cities, can be adaptation to climate change, can be renewable energies can be many things, so in industry investing in new processes or more innovative aspects. So I think that this uh, dichotomy is a little bit uh, too simple in, for my taste. I think that what is important is that the revenue is used for a climate policy at large. If, if I may ask a sort of a follow-up to that, I, I mean, the sometimes I guess it might be difficult for the average citizen to, to understand where those revenues have gone, particularly when they're, if it's funding towards technology or large adaptation projects. Um, is there other ways to make this sort of more directly visible to, to citizens of Europe? The defects of, or the failures of ETS is that uh, we are not very good advertising these projects. I think that it's important that uh, we put more visibility that the money that is uh, in the revenues from Germany, Spain, Netherlands, uh, Poland, all Europe is invested in real projects that uh, we are very good in doing that and very bad in advertising that. So I'm sure that there are mechanisms and it's, I think it's uh, 
is still a um, pending pending key point on uh, on the ETS to give better visibility of what uh, member states and countries do with this money in climate policies. Thank you. Um, okay, so that that brings us to the the end of the the time that we had available. Um, I'm sort of just adjusting to these these new virtual sessions. I would like to welcome everybody to to give the panelists an applause, but I'm I'm not sure that that if that will be heard. <laughs> but at this, um, I would say there's been a fascinating discussion. We've covered a, um, a large range of topics, and I, I would really thank thanks again to the to the Conrad Adnar Stiftung for for convening this event, and also to the to the panelists for a really frank and open discussion. I very much enjoyed it, and I hope everybody um, listening along did as well. So, Dennis, I'm passing the, the microphone to you. Thank you very much, William. Um, it's really good to see that uh, nearly all of the uh, listeners stayed until the end. We still have uh, 60 listeners. So I just wanted to thank all of the speakers for their contributions, but also, of course, the listeners to their questions and their involvement. And um, I would like to reiterate that this was the first out of a series of um, events we are going to organize on the external dimension of the European Green Deal. The next one will be on green finance. And all of our webinars are recorded, so you um, are very welcome to look at uh, our Facebook page later to listen again to uh, our first um, <clears throat> to our first event today. Um, again, it was good to have you. Stay tuned. Have a look at uh, our um, Facebook page and on our social media. And we are looking forward to work with you, to engage, and of course also to create further bridges between um, the Global South and European institutions. For us, it's really important to get messages across and um, to exchange um, lessons from different perspectives. Thank you very much and all the best to you. And thank you very much. And of course, last but not least, a big thank you to Louis. Louis Morier, who is the project manager who has worked very hard to um, bring uh, the different speakers together and also to prepare the content of this webinar. Thank you very much, uh, Louis, for your hard work and for staying in the background and organizing this webinar. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.